Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Esther Fuchs has seen both sides of it. She's been in the sedate, comforting life of a college professor, and she's also been in the shooting gallery of City Hall politics. She's here to tell us the difference. Is there a difference? And uh, welcome. And is there a difference? Oh well, first of all, thanks for inviting me, <laughs> no, Ronnie. It's welcome. really just a pleasure to be here with you. Um, Academics is not as sedate as most people <laughs> think, so I have to say, having been through the tenure struggle or the tenure wars and uh, having survived the politics of the university, that was somewhat a, uh, training, huh? a training ground for coming to City Hall. But frankly, you know, nothing is like City Hall and nothing is like City Hall politics. So um, it was uh, quite an extraordinary change of pace for me to to say the least. <laughs> I know you love teaching and you love your students, but do you miss it? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, made a career decision that I wanted to return to the university. Yeah. Um, I had tenure at Columbia and I really love teaching and I do love my students and um, I like to have some time to actually think through things before you actually have to make a decision about them. Uh, the pace is a little slower, although I think uh, not as slow as it used to be for me, so some things change. Um, but I certainly miss City Hall. I, I would be in denial if I didn't say that. And I've kept engaged in some ways. Yeah, um, I think that helps, doesn't it? Because you've still got a little bit of that excitement. It's the immediacy of the city government. Don't you th don't, that's what always impressed me. You know, if you're in the state government, you go up to Albany, and it's a distance between where you live and where you go, or you go to Washington. But there's City Hall. It's so approachable with the steps. Of course, now you have to go through all that stuff to get in. But you can still protest on the steps and right. get back there now, yeah. unlike in the Giuliani period when, when the steps were closed. Right. So. But it's that immediacy. You're right in the middle of the people you're governing, so you get that back and forth and that constant pace and excitement. That's a fabulous point, and it's something um, that I actually got to talk about in my classes, because when you teach democratic participation or American politics, most of the students really don't believe that they make a difference or that they have any capacity. Even the smart ones and the politically engaged ones, it's hard to convince them that voting makes a difference or they can actually send an email, write a letter, go down and, do, and be part of a demonstration and that anybody's paying attention. They know they can be active because yeah. students tend by nature to be active, but that anybody pays attention. And we both know from our experience in government that they pay, attention. they pay attention. This is a very important part of the day. What goes on on the steps? Um, who's out there? And what kind of press coverage it gets? And all of those uh, venues, what kind of letters came in about a policy announcement that might have happened that week? All of that actually is um, important to people who run for elective office uh, and who have to govern afterwards. Is and it good? Or is it a good thing that? It's so easily impacted by public opinion. It's, you know, it's, uh, I have mixed views of all of this. Uh, I think public opinion and the public engagement is probably the least of our problems in making government work. The dysfunction is really more, I think, about federalism and the connection between city and state government and mm -hmm. national government mm -hmm. and the abdication of, of authority and responsibility at the national level. I mean, we have a situation in New York now, which I think is fascinating, where, where Mayor Bloomberg articulated in Plan NYC essentially a sustainability and environmental policy agenda. For the future of the city. And right, and he, with a whole strategy for implementation. Since when is sustainability and the environment local government policy area. You know, historically when you teach that, you taught, you know, basic city services, police, fire, and sanitation are the things that local government does, and big infrastructure projects, that's national. You know, there was some sense of the distribution of authority, division of labor. But because of the abdication of federal authority in a whole range of policy areas, both in terms of thinking progressively as well as funding, mayors like Michael Bloomberg, and he's not the only one, have begun to really <coughs> focus in a different way on what local governments can and, do. Well, and it, what's so interesting now with, with the price of gasoline and the whole crunch of oil, and then in the same paper, 
the uh, MTA announcement that they don't have enough money, so they can't continue to make the repairs, and they may raise the fares, that shows a lack of such of any kind of coherent planning between the different That's right. Levels. This is extraordinary. Is On the transportation issue alone, you know, we could spend the whole show right. because the public is now ready for a variety of obvious of reasons for mass transit. Right. They're desperate. And the All is, across the country. Right. We in New York, at least, we've got some infrastructure in place. But we're talking about cities like Houston and... And uh, getting to these cities. Right. How do you get there? And then they're all spread out. These are cities which everyone needs a car to get to work. Uh, you know, I was on some federal federal uh, panel where they were talking about the need to make sure that poor working people have access to a car so that they can get to work. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, why would you want to create access to automobiles for poor people? When we're so worried when, about the right, air, everything else, right. and so the cost. Right. So instead of thinking out of the box, like, it, it's time to have people create incentives for people to move back in and create density mm -hmm. again so mm -hmm. that we can deal with the environmental issues and create mass transit that actually can work and pay at least partly for itself. People in Washington are still thinking about making sure that people have access to automobiles. It's so crazy. It's, it's insane. And what we've done to the national rail in transportation. Right. Um, do you think, you were there during t term limits and with a lot of interest on term limits. And do you think back to public opinion and each public official's, elected public official's concern about the future. Right. <laughs> has that impacted, do you think that? And, that you and, know, that I've been thinking about that a lot because I was initially a supporter of term limits, both for the city council and the mayor, because me too. when the system was broken, if you can't, if there's no way to really run against or challenge an incumbent, if basically incumbents cannot lose because of how the system is structured, then it's broken and you need to do something I agree about with you it. totally. That was my position but, too, but it hasn't worked out the way we thought. Yeah, what's really happened is, you know, the, the um, interesting members of the city council are essentially looking beyond the position for their next job and you find a lot more grandstanding and self-indulgence uh, from the members of the council, when you need a collective body to act collectively, it cannot be about individual members of the council standing up and trying to get a press conference and press attention so that people know their name when they run for another office. Now, obviously, that's not everybody, but that's a big dysfunctional aspect of term limits. And I, I actually think probably three terms would make sense. I'm not at this point ready to throw out the baby with the bathwater in a staggered way and it should be staggered the biggest mistake up front was moving everybody out at the same time i yes. mean that was just a mistake and that should have been corrected and i think the voters uh, nervousness about um, just having incumbents stay for thirty years it, it should not be a full-time lifetime job elective right. office that's not what the founders wanted we wanted but, citizen politicians but does that raise the question that you have to be able to be wealthy enough or have the ability to go back and forth in a job so that you can serve public service. I agree with you. I, I always believed that you ran for office, you presented yourself because you had some specific interests you wanted to see to accomplish. And it wasn't a career ladder, which I think politics and public office has now become. You run for the lower and you keep moving up. I don't see um, why in politics you should be held to a different standard than anybody else in their career. People move around all the time. I see you know, students who come back to me, if they stay in a job for more than two yeah. years, it's, they yeah. view that as a long period of time. So the old style career ladder where you stay in one company or you stay in government for a long period of time and you sort of move your way up is certainly not what young people are doing. And I don't see why, if you're effective as a representative, that that's not a skill set that you can use in other yeah. in other careers. The other thing, The other thing that's taken place is that in areas with low participation, you see everybody switching jobs yeah. and family members yeah. replacing other family members, and that's a total corruption yeah, of the we, intention. We have essentially resurrected the old it, machines exactly. now in a different form with, you know, uh, basically these, it's become a family business. Now, you know, you can't tell kids not to do something because their parents did it. It, you know, happens yeah. everywhere. 
but the extent to which the trading, as you said, is going on between running for city council, running for the state legislature, and then essentially saying, okay, let's flip now, yeah. let's switch. It, it's transparently, you know, borderline but they, but it, corruption. But it works. That's it's, what's so crazy. Because of the name recognition, yeah. partly. I mean, the public yeah. does have a limited um, ability to focus on local politics. Does that raise another question that there is an adequate reporting of local politics? Yeah, I, you know, the reporting of local politics, especially state politics, is really abysmal. And, you know, I've thought about that. People do not want to go to Albany. They do not want to shine that light on Albany. And it, but it's not all the press's fault. The public just doesn't, they're not okay. interested. They are not interested. And from survey research that I've done, the way to get people interested in politics is to focus on neighborhood-based issues that they care about that affect their neighborhood and their family. And if you can connect politics to people's neighborhood or their family, they'll pay attention. You know when people mobilize, it's usually about something in their backyard. But there's a way of educating people and linking them to these issues so that they can understand that it's also about them. Because really for far too long most people felt like, you know, the political decisions are not about me. They don't affect me. And it's, on, it's usually not until a crisis that you can get people to pay that kind of attention. So we could do better on this front of linking people more directly and helping them understand, you know, how their future really depends upon paying attention. So so that's a great segue, right, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, into a project I've been working on, which is really, really exciting. It's a New York first, and I've been working on it with the public advocate, Betsy Gottbaum, and Mayor Bloomberg in his Office of Operations, Jeff Kay, and Mary McCormick from the Fund for the City of New York. And um, it's called New York City Feedback Citywide Customer Survey, and I don't know if uh, people can see this, but we'll show it. Yeah. Um, they're going to uh, a random sample of thousands and thousands of New Yorkers. This is an enormous survey, not just 1,500 mm -hmm. like the survey research operations do, um, but there's a sufficient sample so that every community board will have a statistically representative sample in New York, and so the data can be broken out by neighborhood, which is very important. But the survey is really about asking people not just what they think about city government, but it is um, specific about the service delivery issues and whether or not they're being responded to and there's effectiveness. It's about 311, uh, asking how that's working for people and, and listing a whole range of issues both by neighborhood as well as citywide, because in New York is yeah. a city of neighborhoods. So then it gets broken down and the, and the different community boards get the answers from theirs. The data will be available by community board and also there's a series of demographic yeah. questions so we can look at, you know, whether renters or homeowners uh, see things differently or by age and demographic characteristics, by what language you speak in your home, those kinds of things, but it really, um, it's really a detailed survey, and I'm really hoping that everybody really fills these questionnaires out. You can do it online, by the way. If you get it in the mail, you can just go online and But it's interesting online. because you like it, and it's up your alley with the demographics and the figures and what people think. Now, take it to your city government experience. How do you carry out to respond to some of those things. You know, we did, when I was in the council, we did something called the Project Punch List, and it was a, mm -hmm. a questionnaire and everything. We recruited people, and people had a block. Right. And we covered the whole district about where there's a pothole, what lampposts needed, what all the different things you needed, sidewalk repair and that kind of stuff. And it was great. And then we had to compile it, and then we had to send it to the agencies, and that's when it broke down. So, so that's you know a major what's part of your about, governmental so part you know, of it. Yeah, what's really important about this is it is being done with the mayor's office of operations. Yeah. They are spearheading this. They're the ones who are paying for the survey. They're the ones who are going to coordinate with the agencies to implement on the basis of the findings of the survey. That's great. It so it's a real accountability exciting. thing that so, can be implemented. The public advocate has had a really key role in it. And the other piece of this is going to be focus groups that the public advocate will be doing with the Fund for the City of New York so that 
when we find in the aggregate data, in the general data that comes from the surveys, specific kinds of problems, let's say, you know, um, there is one neighborhood, one neighborhood or one community board that seems off the charts on sanitation or off the charts on rat control. We can do focus groups and find out more then right. from what? the individuals of what are they thinking, what is going on exactly in those communities as a, a follow-up to the general survey data. You worked a lot in the government in improving systems between agencies. Yes. So it interests me that you <coughs> want to go back to the federal, state, and local. It's very important, isn't it? And I always noticed in politics that local officials and state officials and, and very rarely get together. Yeah, it's really it's a, true. It's uh, The issue is both cross-agency collaboration as well as different levels of government collaborating, which is probably even harder than the cross-agency stuff. Um, and I was in some ways naive, which I think was good, because I basically focused on some interesting problems that the mayor found interesting and decided, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to figure out who is engaged, and let's get everybody together, work out the solution, and figure out the implementation yeah. plan, right? Yeah. Sounds simple, of yeah, course. Right. <laughs> so, um, of course, it's, you know, it's crazy difficult, and people were, in many ways, looking at me like I had totally lost my mind. And also, you know, you get enormous pushback from the people who are controlling things, the status quo, the people who do not want change, whether they're in city government or state government or whether it's one agency versus another. Um, people do not, you know, when I worked on the out-of-school time initiative, for example, that was seven different agencies. Yeah. And how do you get them all together? And they, and there was a lot of movement. You know, we were in that instance moving kids who were in the daycare system but were in school out of the daycare system into these after school, school programs. Um, the daycare system is hard to coordinate. The daycare with system is a, was a mess, still has it's problems. People are working on it. But um, one of the pieces of this puzzle that I didn't really understand, I'll admit that up front, but worked it to my advantage. I was looking at the policy. I, I saw that this the funding for after school was unevenly distributed across the city. I map, we mapped it. You know, I worked with a couple of agencies, the Department of Technology and, of course, DYCD and Jeannie Mulgrave, the commissioner there. And we had a grant from the Wallace Foundation, which was very important. And we mapped it. And lo and behold, there are certain neighborhoods which are getting more money than other neighborhoods, and it doesn't correlate with the number of kids in the well, neighborhood. That, isn't that partly because the original child care centers were built and in neighborhoods, and then the population shifts, and you've still got the the construction. That was partly the child care problem, and right. this was the um, after school. the after school money. So there were two problems exactly like okay. that. One related exactly to what you say, how the child care system was structured, and one to an after school system that before the mayor came in was didn't see an RFP for eight years. Right during the Giuliani during administration. During the Giuliani administration. So you had, and it wasn't that there were, there were a lot of good organizations doing good things, but there's a fairness issue, and as the populations move around, you want to make sure that new immigrant yeah. groups get, a, get some money and that there is some equity in the system based upon the number of youth, at least in a neighborhood. So um, part of the funding was coming through that daycare money. Well, what I didn't realize, and so the logic of it, no one could disagree with the logic of the policy. Of course, as you know and I know, the logic of the policy doesn't always Has carry the to day. Do. <laughs> <laughs> and what I didn't realize at the time was that the daycare system was completely unionized. And the after-school system is not. not. And there are a variety of reasons for that. It's partly because a lot of part-time people do it, and you bring in people with special skills. And it's a different, it's a different pedagogy for kids who are in after-school programs. And the, you know, there are some teachers in it, but it's not a specialized, like the daycare workforce. And you know, it makes sense for a daycare system, but it clearly does not make sense for after-school programming. Um, so. <laughs> if you move the money, I don't have to tell you what that produced in terms of a political turmoil. If you're moving money from one system to another, which turns out one wasn't unionized and one was, which I frankly didn't know in the beginning because it wasn't of concern, yeah. 
um, clearly you're going to get pushback from somewhere about doing that, which had nothing to do with what needed to be done, the quality of the policy. That's just an example. The other example, which is great, is you know, the groups that had money certainly didn't want to give up their money right. and share it with some groups in a different neighborhood. So it's, it's that kind of thing within, within the government. And then I always found the government reacted to what people thought was happening, not what was actually happening very often as a result of our manipulation of the press and the and this goes back to our protests and everything else you know if they think that's what it is and then you have to look anyway it's complicated what i want to know is let's talk federal a little bit mm -hmm. uh, do you think that if a democrat's in the white house it'll be different yes i do i mean um, i used to teach a course called uh, presidential parties and elections for twenty years and I used to have a really hard time with my students convincing them that there that it made a difference if you yeah. voted for a Democrat or a Republican um, until the current George Bush. And when I said to my class, "Well, if Al Gore had won, would it be different than what George Bush did?" And there wasn't, you know, people just said, "Ah." Oh, of course it would have been different. So the, old, the, the theory in American presidential politics of the Tweedledum, Tweedledee, it doesn't matter who comes in, it's the same um, special interests that govern and affect policy, is pr frankly ridiculous. It's not the same anymore. You can see so clearly that we're in a very important period. Uh, I think it's what we call in political science a sort of realigning period in which uh, the majority, the future of American politics is really at stake now of what direction the country goes in in public policy. We had eight years in which the public figured out they don't want to go that way anymore. And they are looking to the Democratic Party to change course to make a difference. Does the federal government, that really drives things, right? I mean, the state government is really a passive pass-through, isn't it? How much of our policy does the state government initiate? State government, particularly in the last 15 years, initiates a lot of policy because it creates the regulatory structure in which a lot of federal money comes through. So a really good example... Like child care. Child care. And no child left behind, the right. schools. So in the instances where the federal government has made policy, um, recently, which, you know, has to do temporary assistance to needy families, TANF, which was Bill Clinton's big welfare reform, and you'll take George Bush's um, uh, No Child Left Behind. These are all mediated through the state governments, and what the way these programs were designed is that there's a lot of flexibility at the state level on how that money gets distributed. I mean... And that's mostly administrative, isn't it, and not legislative? It is. It's affected by the legislature also. Yeah, but but I always found when we were talking child care, it was really the agency for whatever it was called, Children and Families, right. that decided what the regulations were, and frequently they were as uh, un understandable as... The legislature can affect that if they care to, Yeah, because part of it is a question of block granting, where in the negotiation of the budget, it's... Which, how much money are we going to put in each pot? Um, and then that makes a huge difference. Child care is a great example yeah. because child care has moved around. And one of the things Pataki did was separate out, segregate out child care from the general social service budget. Um, that was supposed to be a good thing. It's not obvious to me it's a good thing when you're cutting child care. Right. and you have less money so it's harder than to move money over and plus the standards issue is huge the I mean that was one of the things I got very involved in at City Hall um, which was the state regulatory apparatus which really impacts your ability to be rational <laughs> about making policy I mean we had to and fortunately you know we were able to come to some terms when you find the right people but not everybody wants to deal with this I mean we had this issue on after school I'll use that again because yeah. I've started right. with that so a lot of after school programs we did it we did a wonderful memorandum of understanding with the Department of Ed we were able to do this because of mayoral control when it was the yeah. old Board of Ed they charged 
all of the community-based organizations to do their after-school programs the buildings. in those buildings. Yeah. They charge them rent. Hello, are we not the same government, the same people? Is that completely irrational? These organizations run on a shoestring to begin with. I mean, right. all the support they can get. I mean, you want oversight, but you can't give them the burden of providing a service and not funding them for it. So, you know, they charge them because they could, because they were the <laughs> Board of Ed. So we did an MOU in which when the money got allocated through a competitive process, they would actually end up in a school and not have to pay rent, right? So what we found out when we started working with those schools, that there was a different regulatory system from the Department of Health signing off That's if right. you were in a school building or if you were in a community center. And different for during the school day and after, after school. school. Like, why would a nine-year-old have a different need a different health standard during the school day and after, after school? school. Right. And it had to do with things like how much the windows open. I mean, right. it was. So, did you get it straightened? Yes, out? we. That part of it, we did. <laughs> there are obviously still ongoing and it, and issues. And we're at the end of our program, which is hard to believe. But that oh, kind of that kind of lack of common sense pervades all government, unfortunately, right. and it's and you can't pinpoint exactly no. whose fault and it is. No, and somebody's going to want to have to take it on, yeah. and the thing that Bloomberg did, I have to say, and continues to do, is he empowered people in his administration, and he continues to do that, to fix things that are broken. And that, to me, is an enormous contribution in which, like, all over the country, mayors are coming here to see yeah. what did he do differently right. that gave people this feeling that you could actually fix this stuff. Well, Esther, you leave that on a, p a positive note because maybe we will be able to fix some things. Thank you very much. Oh, it's such a pleasure. It's to always be here. good. Thanks. <laughs>